Uh, it's an honor to be here, um, and really sort of the culmination of this whole project. So I really appreciate you having me. It was a, a great joy to write this book. I discovered a lot, and I guess what I'd like to do is read the introduction. It's not very long, uh, maybe 20 minutes, and then tell you a little bit about some of the discoveries that I made, uh, unfamiliar authors that probably people haven't heard of that I can highly recommend, um, and then open it up for questions or comments. I know. Some of you here are related to some of these writers, so it would be good to have a discussion. Um, but I'll start by reading the introduction. Um, there's an epigraph to the book that comes from Edwin Dobb, who's a native beautician. Um, and he, he wrote this. He said, much of the current romance of Butte is the doomed romance of ruin, of traces and whispers and ghostly things that aren't readily graspable. History, we must remember, is the study of the invisible, a refusal to let bygones be bygones, and the academic equivalent of an endless wait, um, which I like because it uh, refers in a way to James Joyce, one of my favorite writers. Um, and then the introduction is just called Butte America, and the, for my epigraph there, I picked uh, Burton Braley. Uh, great, also lived in Butte for a time, and one of America's most famous poets in his day, best-selling poet, uh, probably outsold Jewel. Um, <laughs> this is what he wrote. She's ugly, you say, old Butte is, and grimy, black, and drear. Why, partner, I never could see it, and I've lived here many a year. There's nothing pretty about her, but somehow she's strong and free, and big and rugged, and well, comrade, she looks pretty good to me. Butte, Montana, clings white-knuckled to a flank of the Continental Divide. At night, the lights of the uptown seem to spill down into the flat as if someone poured out a sack of jewels. But by day, you see a gritty, rough-hewn city on a hill, clinging precipitously to the edges of what was once the world's largest open-pit copper mine, the Berkeley Pit. The town emerges from a landscape of sagebrush and tenacious conifer, forest among outcroppings of granitic rock, bordered to the south and the west by impressive alpine peaks, the highlands and the Anaconda Range hemmed in on the east by a steep wall of sharp hills known as the East Ridge. To visit the city of Butte today is to step back into another time. The uptown resembles a smaller version of Chicago or Milwaukee or even San Francisco with its city blocks of gilded age brick buildings, many of them now abandoned or refurbished, narrow avenues and alleys lying with the remnants of once fabulous storefronts and nightclubs. And like distant cousins of the fin de siècle skyscrapers, a dozen towering head frames still rise above the mouths of the old mines that operated before the pit began to swallow the town. <coughs> From a geographical perspective, it's somewhat baffling that Butte exists at all. As Alexander Winchell observed in 1911, Butte is an excellent example of a city built and prosperous in spite of the fact that all those external conditions generally thought of as geographic are extremely unfavorable. Butte has no natural water supply. It has no natural fuel supply. It has no natural routes for transportation, uh, which I think is a point of irony in that the two interstates. <laughs> <laughs> I think money changed hands. <laughs> uh, it has not even a natural food supply. But almost from its inception in the 1860s, those who have visited the place agree that there's no place quite like it on Earth. The earliest prospectors were taken by the high alpine setting and the colors it showed in their pans. But it wasn't long before more serious miners realized the hill held a bonanza of precious metals of unprecedented magnitude. What might easily have boomed briefly but become just another quaint ghost of a mining town, indistinguishable from hundreds of others like it, has instead achieved immortal fame as the richest hill on earth, nourished by the legends of its copper kings and the panoply of characters who wandered its streets when Butte was in its prime. In the same years that Butte evolved as an industrial colony and proving ground for some of the world's richest and most rapacious capitalists, the Butte Hill also stood as a beacon to laborers and union men everywhere, calling the oppressed to action as the country industrialized. From the beginning of the Gilded Age right up through the Depression, Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Utah Phillips, and Mark Ross sang on its streets, and modern icon of labor, Frank Little, was martyred, hanged by the neck from a railroad trestle with the old vigilante's mark 3777 pinned to his chest. <laughs> 
Long considered an ugly place, the town has lately become an especially hideous symbol of corporate irresponsibility and industrial poisoning as it now holds in the bosom of the Berkeley pit over one billion cubic feet of highly toxic water, making it one of the chief Superfund sites in the United States. Throughout the entire course of its often sordid history, however, the spirit of its inhabitants has been indomitable. Residents of Butte have always taken a kind of quiet pride in the very ugliness that surrounds them. For them, the garish eyesore of the immense pit is merely the latest scar the town has been forced to bear. Famous throughout Montana, Butte Pride is a high-octane distillation of rural American sentiment, one of the more volatile vapors of which is a firm dedication to the working classes. Unlike many of the more rural parts of Montana, boats cast in Butte are a solid shade of blue. <laughs> in many ways, that pride epitomizes the history of the town. In the nadir of its economic woes in the early 1980s, the Chamber of Commerce, as part of its plan to rejuvenate the city, printed thousands of bumper stickers that simply said, Butte, America. Butte truly is a kind of microcosmic crystal of the entire country, a perfect intersection of its problems and its promise, an unintended travesty of John Winthrop's City on a Hill. It makes sense, then, that an astonishing number of writers have chosen Butte, Montana as the setting for their work. However noble or ignoble the narrative of Butte may be, it is in some sense an abridged version of the story of America itself, a story of people from nearly every corner of the world who found their way there to labor in pursuit of its promised wealth and an ensuing saga of the battle between forces of unbridled capitalism and social justice. In 1970, novelist Richard K. O'Malley Telescope 200 years of American history when he took this snapshot of Butte in his classic Mile High, Mile Deep. And as I was walking in today, I saw that there's an epigraph from uh, Richard K. O'Malley carved in stone on the side of this building. This is what he wrote. Irishmen working as far south as Leadville, Colorado heard about the Butte strike. And Finn, sweating it out in the Minnesota iron workings, heard about it. And the Swedes and the Cornish men and the Montenegrins and the Italians and the Yugoslavs and the Norwegians heard about it. And the Greeks, too, but they thought in terms of restaurants. Working men have to eat. And the gamblers from everywhere, they all came to Butte. They filled its dirty streets with the noise of a dozen tongues, and they filled its tunnels and stopes and manways with themselves, and the sound of buzzies biting into the rock was loud down below. The ethnic diversity of Butte was just one factor that set the city apart from most of the rest of Montana. Industrial blight was another. Even today, tourists don't travel to Butte expecting to find blue ribbon trout streams or trailheads in old growth forests. Aesthetically, Butte has more in common with Pittsburgh or Cleveland than it does with Bozeman or Missoula. This may explain why dozens of popular writers in the last half century, including bestsellers like Kath Kathleen Windsor, Wanderers Eastward, Wanderers West, uh, 1965, and Henry Sutton, the exhibitionist in 1967, worked Butte into narratives that ultimately have little to do with Montana. Several recent novels, including Sandra Dallas's Buster Midnight's Cafe, Rife Larson's The Selected Works of T.S. Spivet, and Paul's Tatangi's Evil Knievel Days, seem to use Butte as a setting mainly because of its unusual features and colorful history rather than because of its location in Montana. Butte provides an immense vault of narrative inspiration for writers, in part because it was a cosmopolitan city, even if it happened to exist in one of the least populated states. And the hefty catalog of real-life characters who played roles in the course of its history easily aligns with the tableau of the American story writ large. This book is the first comprehensive study of the remarkably broad stream of literature and film to flow out of Butte, covering works that appeared not long after the city was laid out in 1865, all the way up to novels that have been, appeared in the last few years. This study indirectly catalogs Butte's colorful history, beginning with its inception as a gold and silver camp, through its de development as one of the leading copper producers in the world, into the post-mining era that has left Butte scrambling to forge a post-industrial economy out of the architectural remnants of a once thriving metropolis. And though the novels considered here were published across a span of more than a century, a handful of common themes within them may be clearly discerned. Chief among them is a tendency to personify the city as a character with an identity all of its own. It's a chicken and egg argument whether Butte's fame as a city sui generis has led so many writers to choose Butte as a setting, or whether its fame derives from all the novels written about it. Either way, 
The whole reciprocal process is a kind of cultural dynamo that has kept the place thriving even in the lean years. Butte may be sui generis, but it is also, in its mythology, autochthonous. Good uh, geology word there. <laughs> uh, the literary history of Butte exposes some faults in the conventional wisdom regarding mining camps as the exclusive prerogative of men, since at least a third of the novels in this collection were penned by women. And even in most of the books by men, the female characters exude strength and self-reliance. As several 20th century historians of Butte, Mary Murphy, Ellen Crane, and Janet Finn, to name just three, have emphasized, the history of Butte is in many ways a story both told by and lived by women. Another perennial theme in the literature of Butte is the presentation of an often violent struggle between labor and industry, a theme that often converges with the theme of political corruption, a disease whose symptoms presented at every level of power from crooked cops walking their beats uptown to state legislators who were essentially bought and paid for with company money. During the pioneer years, Montana was well known for the scandal of its lawlessness and vigilantism, which became even more acute during the political scandals around the turn of the century. If in the 1860s Montana was seen as the essence of the lawless West, by 1900 Butte had become a familiar emblem of corporate and political corruption. A key aspect of what the West was coming to mean was not so much a geographical concept as a cultural one, a shift in sensibility that contributed to the idea of Butte. The West referred to as much a way of doing business and developing enterprises as it did to a particularly bounded region of the country. Butte exemplified the culture and atmosphere of what Mark Twain called the Gilded Age, marked by extremes of wealth and poverty. Images of Butte often contrast shoeless and filthy urchins playing on tailings piles against the affluent neighborhoods on the west side with their meticulously landscaped gingerbread homes built by corporate executives. Gilded Age disparity was pandemic in the west, but especially acute in Butte. Writing in the century in 1903, Ray Standard Baker observed, quote, The most western of cities is not Portland or Seattle, but Butte City. 600 miles to the east of the coast. Baker was trying to express to Easterners the difficult idea that, as he put it, what we call Western is singularly misplaced in the West, at least outside of Butte. <laughs> Ever since Frederick Jackson Turner confounded historians in 1893 with his controversial frontier thesis, academics and cultural geographers have been arguing about precisely what is meant by the phrase the West in the first place, <laughs> although a concept of it, the frontier, a term no more lucid seems to be a critical part of it. But in the late 19th century, at least one of the things the West meant in the collective imagination of Americans was a part of the country beyond firm reach of the law. The West may not have been in the abject state of anarchy it was in the 1850s and 1860s, but it nevertheless operated in the last decades of the 19th century with considerable less judicial oversight than did the rest of the country. And nowhere was this as plainly evident as in Butte, Montana. As Christopher Connolly wrote in his inimitable history of Butte called The Devil Learns to Vote, this struggle between mining magnets of almost limited wealth, uh, limitless wealth made hundreds of men and ruined thousands. It perverted the moral sense of entire communities. It destroyed promising careers and checked worthy names from the scroll of state and national fame. It corrupted the machinery of justice and it placed the lawmaking power on the auction block. One other salient fact emerges from the present survey. The majority of novels associated with Butte happen to be set during a 20 year period from 1890 to 1910, known as the War of the Copper Kings. That largely political battle segued into a period of corporate finagling and consolidation that achieved its zenith with the triumph of the standard oil backed Anaconda Company. This period in Montana history amounts to a sort of hypertrophied narrative of the Gilded Age. And it makes sense that no matter what time period they happen to live in themselves, writers would be drawn to this era, ready-made as it is for the stuff of high drama. The more convincing writers who do so, Richard Wheeler is a great example. They succeed in their efforts because they show how historical mistakes have a way of haunting us into the present, driving home the point that the Gilded Age, in fact, looks very much like our own. But a majority does not mean a totality, and many other worthy books ignore that well-traveled historical path, choosing instead to explore other elements of Butte's story, 
confirming the conclusion that the literature of Butte is more than a motley of novels about the Copper Kings. The fact that so many of the novels about Butte hardly mention the boom years or the Clark Daly feud is itself evidence that the story of Butte continues to be an American story. The literature of Butte is a diverse library of narratives that continues to add new books to the stacks. Only one previous short study devoted exclusively to novels associated with Butte exists, and it appeared over 30 years ago. Written by one of Montana's most revered historians, Richard Rader, it takes a rather dim, and one could argue narrow, view of the works about Butte. As a result, Rader comes off as slightly sclerotic, ready to call nearly everything from the shelves. He grudgingly admits that a few of Myron Brennig's novels occasionally shine, but his ultimate judgment is, quote, Butte has not been the source of a great American book. <laughs> a statement that strikes contemporary ears, by which I mean mine, as slightly modernist and cranky. For that matter, elsewhere in reference to Butte novels, Rader called Perch of the Devil the best of them, an assessment which I doubt any other reader, historian, literary critic, postmodernist, or modernist would concur. To be fair, Rader did rescue some of these books from the discard pile, such as James Francis Rabbit, Rabbit's High, Walk, Low, and Wide Open. But one wonders why he bothered at all to document a collection of which he lost so little love. Rader died in 1995 and missed the opportunity to appreciate some works that have appeared more recently, but he overlooked completely a considerable number of over, older works, including Josephine Bates, uh, Gerald Lutz, and David McCouich, three writers certainly worthy of attention even if none of them won a Nobel Prize. Speaking of history, a certain class of cynics likes to suggest that in the end, one can't very well distinguish history from fiction, since the truth always depends on who's telling the story. That may be true as far as it goes, but a welcome corollary of that proposition, too often lost on those same critics, is that fiction is often uncannily adept at capturing the spirit of an age, even if it is not entirely conscientious about facts. One stands to gain a better understanding of what Chicago felt like in 1890 by reading Dreiser's Sister Carrie, for example, than by plotting through Bessie Pierce's meticulous history of Chicago. Though fiction is by its very nature made up, it strives for what critics call verisimilitude, a fancy Latin word that means like the truth, and carries with it in its English usage a sense of a story told so well that it certainly could be true. Accordingly, Fiction often preserves the past by bringing it alive, quite in contrast to history, which all too often, as one critic famously put it, reduces itself to polishing tombstones. One could reasonably argue that the discipline of history itself stands to benefit from a literary survey, survey just as much as the novelist stands to benefit from a historical review of the time period surrounding the novel she's writing. The record of the world captured for posterity in a well-written novel ensures that history does not have an expiration date, that one does not need always to resort to footnotes, mothballs, or formaldehyde to preserve the past. As the Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Jack Rakoff has observed, <coughs> the composition of any narrative history requires decisions as to perspective and dramatic structure that differ little from the imaginative contrivances of the novelist. While the history of Butte can be divided into different periods in various ways, it goes without saying that such divisions are never very discreet or tidy. The problem is confounded because a literary study of a collection of novels that by their virtue of their subject matter may all be classified as historical puts the reviewer in a dilemma. Arrange the discussion in order of time period in which the books are set or arrange them according to the order in which they were written. I've chosen the latter course, but it may be worth pointing out that in general, Butte history may be divided into five periods. The gold placers of the 1860s, the years of silver mining up to the 1880s, the ascendancy of copper and the War of the Copper Kings up to 1910, the consolidation of the Anaconda Copper Company and its hegemony lasting up into the 1980s, and then the post-mining era from the 1980s up to the present. This survey looks at works from every one of those periods except the first, that is the gold mining era, um, and only because I could not find anything earlier than 1888, which is pretty early for Montana. It should also be noted that this study does not purport to be exhaustive or approaching anywhere near the analytical depth that the literary works of Butte deserve. What you hold in your hands now amounts to a little more than a field report filed by a literary prospector in the fervent hope that others will continue to seek out the loads of literary ore running through the richest hill on earth. 
Um, that's the introduction. Um, I would like to talk briefly about uh, three novels in particular that I discovered that you may not have heard of. I know everybody here is probably familiar with uh, Dashiell Hammett and Red Harvest and certainly Mary McLean. Um, but I found three books that I don't think uh, most people are aware of that I, that I want to give a plug for and try to track them down. Um, many of the books that I looked at are out of print. Uh, that is, you would have trouble finding them in a bookstore. But many of them are available now online at the digital library uh, or Google Books. Um, and you can actually read a scan of them. Others, you can, you can actually order a printed copy of the scan that's available online. Um, the first of these would be uh, Josephine White Bates' book, A Blind Lead, The Story of a Mind. This book, I think it may be one of the earliest Montana novels. I can't think of one earlier. 1888, um, very early. Set in Butte. Um, and this was a complete surprise to me. I discovered the book sort of at random. It turns out to be a pretty good book. Uh, very rare. Uh, I know it is available online if you're interested in reading it, uh, but I think it's significant. Several things are significant about it. Uh, one is that the first book about Butte, one of the earliest novels of Montana, is written by a woman. Um, and many of these books, as I pointed out in the introduction, are written by women. Um, the second book I would recommend is a book called High, Low, and Wide Open by a fellow named uh, uh, James Francis Rabbit, although he used a variation of that, uh, his pen name. He was born in Butte in 1903, grew up here. His father died in the mines when he was three years old. He was raised, he and his three siblings were raised by their mother, um, who, in addition to raising three kids on her own as a single mother, uh, campaigned for woman's suffrage. So this guy had quite a role model. And then he went on to write this novel that featured some very powerful, dynamic uh, female characters, which was unusual for a novel in 1935. Um, I'll, maybe I should read you uh, just one small section of, out of that uh, book to give you an indication of what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, the uh, interesting thing about him is that this is the only book that he wrote it didn't sell very well, um, and he ended up, uh, he died pretty young of a heart attack. Uh, I did track down some of his family in, in uh, Houston, Texas, and they filled me in on some of the details of his life, but this is the only book he ever wrote. Uh, it didn't sell very well, and they burned all the rest of the copies, so it's a uh, very rare book. Um, but it's, it's uh, very much inspired, I think, by Dashiell Hammett's Red Harvest. Um, it's a mystery story, a detective novel. Great. It's got some great lines in it. Um, but to give you an idea of these strong female characters, here's how, uh, here's how one of them speaks. So I said, she delivers what must have been a shocking declaration in 1935. This is the female character. She says, I know what they say about me in town, but I don't care. They're content to stay with one man, to cook greasy meals over hot fires, to lose their looks and figures and have a lot of kids. I don't want that. I won't have that. So they call me fast, because I will not be a fool, because I don't have to be a fool. Um, it sounds more like something you'd read in an Erica John novel from the <laughs> um, So that was one of my uh, favorite discoveries in, in this whole process, uh, was James Francis Rabbit. The last one I'll mention briefly is a war novel called Do Not Go Gentle. Um, and I discovered this one at Second Edition Books just down the street. It's a paperback. I've since acquired a, a very rare copy of the hardback. But it was a bestseller. Um, and the guy who wrote it was called David McCooish. Anybody here know that name at all? He grew up in Butte um, and left... Uh, probably 1942. Um, and the novel is basically his life story. He grew up in, in Walkerville uh, with an alcoholic father who was a minor and pretty brutal. Um, the father died uh, from silicosis just about the time that the son uh, was, went into the, to the military and ended up at Guadalcanal. So it's a pretty amazing war novel in that the first third of it takes place in Butte and Walkerville, 
And then the second third of it is on Guadalcanal. And it was a bestseller because it was such a vivid depiction of that part of the war. And then the last third of it, he's trying to recover from you know, post-traumatic stress in Los Angeles. Um, and I know they have one or two copies of that probably at second edition books, but that one's pretty easy to find on the internet. Um, those, those were three of the, the great highlights I could talk all week about this <laughs> type of this book. I, I love doing it so much. But I'll stop here and see if people have questions or comments. Or I can keep talking. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, this doesn't. Uh, could you repeat the first one? <laughs> Josephine White yeah. Bates. Um, she's a very interesting person for many reasons. Did you get that? Yeah. The name of the book? A Blind Lead. And a blind lead refers to a, a vein of silver. I guess it could also be copper, but in, the, in this novel it's silver. Um, where you follow it thinking that you're going to get to the source, the, the mother love, and instead it just peters out. It's a, it's a pretty gripping narrative of, uh, you know, set in Butte, and these guys, this is when they're silver mining, so there's no power. They're digging this stuff out by hand with windlasses and picks and shovels um, looking for silver and gold. Today's the anniversary of Dashiell Hammett's birth. Did he get, get his literary start in Butte with Red Harvest? Uh, that's a really good question. My sense is that he probably published a few things before that, but uh, Red Harvest was published in 19, late 1928, early 1929, in a series of four uh, installments in a pulp fiction magazine, I think called Black Death or Black Mask, something like that. Um, but he's a very interesting story and fascinating to read about. I mention in the book that Robert Polito, his biographer, says that uh, Lillian Hellman, who was his wife, claimed that he told her that the Pinkertons had offered him $5,000 to assassinate Frank Little. Um, and, you know, I doubt that he did it or took the money, but it did have a profound impact on him. And though he had been a strike breaker for the Pinkertons prior to that, after that, he did a, a 180 and completely renounced strike-breaking and instead joined the Communist Party. He became a card-carrying member for the rest of his life and in fact uh, was called before WHO Act, the House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, refused to testify or renounce his uh, membership in the Communist Party and went to prison. This from a guy who served not only in World War II, but also World War I. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a fascinating story. It's also interesting that he calls Butte uh, Personville, which he then corrupts to Poisonville. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What got you started on this topic? That's a really good question. Um, I have always been a voracious reader, and I guess I just at some point noticed that there, for a town this size, and even at its you know greatest population, it was probably eighty thousand. There's uh, an inordinate number of novels set in Butte. I don't think any other town this size could boast so many literary works written about it. And so then I started trying to find them, and pretty soon the list you know, grew exponentially. Um, I think I talk about 37 novels, a dozen films, and I don't talk about short stories at all, or poetry. Um, there's quite an immense literature of Butte, so I guess that's what kept me interested in it. So you can do a Butte anthology next. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Add all of their short stories. Yeah, somebody should do that. That's long overdue. Sir? Do you, do you have Glittering Hill in there? Yes, I do. I talked about Glittering Hill. The part that I loved is about the description of uh, there's going to be a funeral and them conniving to get the best uh, carts to go to the funeral so they could race back and get to the bar first. Right. <laughs> that, scene is actually, that scene is actually in a lot of uh, Butte narratives uh, because I think it's based on a real event. One interesting thing about Glittering Hill, this is by uh, Clyde Murphy. Um, this was a 1942 or 44 novel. Uh, it was his, his only novel also. He wrote it late in life. He was a lawyer all his life and then he decided to write this great book about Butte. 
uh, so great that it won a bunch of prizes and was bought in Hollywood to make a movie, and Humphrey Bogart was going to star in the movie. Um, but then he saw the script for African Queen and decided to do that instead. <laughs> so the movie never got made, but it would be a great movie. <coughs> yes, ma'am. In the fictional entries, is, do you have a favorite, uh, or do you think anyone kind of managed to capture the spirit of youth? Um, that's a great question. I'll, I'll give two plugs for two of, two of my favorite books. Um, one is uh, Butte Was Like That by uh, Joe Duffy. Anybody familiar with that book? Well, you are obviously. That's uh, the author's uh, grandson. Um, that is a great book. If you, if you want an overview of what Butte was like in the day, I can't recommend a, a better book than that because he has chapters in there on everything, the way people talked, what they ate, what it was like in the mines, what it was like on the street. It's very funny, um, but it's not a novel in the sense that it's got a real clear plot and a leading lady and a, and a villain or anything like that. It's more like a, uh, he uses the novel as an excuse to talk about all the cultural aspects of you. Fascinating book, I highly recommend it. Unfortunately, it's hard to find. Um, I don't know how many copies were originally printed. My guess is a couple thousand. I, I believe so, yeah. Um, and they're still out there. I, I pick them up whenever I can get them. The other one, and this I'll just quote another critic who said, if you only read one novel of Butte, read Richard K. O'Malley's Mile High, Mile Deep. What's interesting about that book is it has nothing to do with the, the Butte in its heyday. It's set during the Depression. Um, 1920s, 1930s, um, and it very much captures the spirit of what it's like to be somebody from Butte, um, and be 17 years old, and drop out of high school, and wonder what you're going to do with your life while you're packing your lunch to go down in the mine, hmm. uh, knowing that that's an easy trap to fall into. So I, I highly recommend that. My personal favorite is Ed Leahy's uh, The Thin Air Gang, yeah. uh, yeah. which was also set in the Depression and has nothing to do with the Copper Kings, but it's a great tale of the Depression and being a bootlegger in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So th I, those three rank pretty high in my list. Ma'am? Did you run into an author named Clark Gleamor at all? No. It's a Galileo in Montana or something like that. He, he's a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, huh. but lived up on Caledonia Street. And, and this is about Butte? Yeah. A novel about Butte? Yeah. Is it very recent? You know, I have it. I don't know. You sent me one, and I... It was I would love to talk to you afterward and maybe get a <laughs> reference to track it down. Sure. Do you know the film Miller's Crossing? Yeah. Which is loosely, I think, based on Red Harvest. At least uh, that, that's, where, that's what they consulted for the dialogue. Um, so the tagline in that movie is, what's the rumpus? Hmm. Uh, and that's right out of Red Harvest. The two books that Ivan Dwight wrote about Butte. Work Song and... Uh, and Sudden Thunder or Sweet, uh, Sweet Thunder, Thunder, I forget. Sweet Thunder. Yeah. I did talk about those in the, in the book. Oh, awesome. Good. They were great books. Yeah, I, one of the things I liked about uh, the first one um, is that the main character in it happens to be Granville Stewart, a thinly disguised Granville Stewart, right. who in his old age, um, you know, he was one of the Montana pioneers, came here in the 1850s, um, was a gold miner, did a lot of things, was involved. I think one person, one historian said, you can't open any of the annals of Montana history in the first hundred years and not see Granville Stewart's name on the page. He was involved in everything. But he was sort of a failure in that he never made money like a lot of his pals, Samuel Hauser and uh, other people. And in his old age, he was uh, facing sort of a grim future when all the pioneers got together and said, we've got to get this guy a job. So the job they got him was the uh, librarian at the Butte Public Library. Which he uh, post he held, I think, for 16 or 17 years while he wrote his memoir, The Great uh, 40 Years on the Plains, I think it's called. What's your opinion of uh, Myron Brennig, and do you know anything about the years that he spent in Butte? Um, 
At the risk of misquoting myself, I'll just summarize what I think is in the book. Um, he grew up in Butte. Um, I think he was born in 1897. He left when he was 16 or 17, maybe even a little bit younger than that. So he spent his, his formative years in Butte. Um, and then he went away to New York City to be a novelist. And he wrote some of the best books about Butte. He wrote, I think, 30 novels. Seven of them are set in Butte. Um, of those seven, three are especially great. Um, the, the famous one is White Open Town, which is you know, very much a story of Butte. But he also wrote Singermon and Sons of Singermon. Two very interesting things about those books, which are also very distinctly Butte novels. Um, the first interesting thing is that they chronicle the life of a Jewish family in Butte. Um, and that's sort of unusual, but it sort of proves how cosmopolitan Butte was. And the other interesting thing about both those novels, written in the 1929 and 1931, is that the main character is uh, homosexual and is pretty open about it in the book, which would have been very unusual for 1929. The, the, both those books were reviewed favorably, um, and Myron Brennig was on the verge of becoming a great novelist, and nobody's really sure what happened. A couple of his movies were made into, uh, a couple of his books were made into movies, including The Sisters. Um, but, but after 1958, his book stopped selling, and he just quit writing. Although he lived, uh, I think he died in 93. He lived quite a long life. A number of people have written their memoirs of growing up in view. Did you consider including memoirs in, in your book? It's funny that you would raise that question because uh, I got in an argument with one of my friends who read the manuscript. And he said, why are you including Richard K. O'Malley's Mile High, Mile Deep? That's not a novel. And I said, yeah, it is. And he said, no, it's a memoir. And it's interesting because it was published as a novel, but I think Richard K. O'Malley himself called it a memoir, uh, even though he changed some of the names. So I also talk about Mary McLean uh, and her book, which was originally titled I Await the Devil's Coming. You know it as the story of Mary McLean. The publisher wouldn't let her use that, that name. <laughs> Although it's been reprinted now with the original title, I Await the Devil's Coming. Um, and I think you're pushing the envelope, I'm pushing the envelope calling it a novel for sure. It, what else can you call it? It's not really a memoir. Uh, it's sort of philosophy. It does have a plot. I, I think it's... I included it precisely because it was so uh, uncategorizable. Um, but no, I tried to avoid memoir. You're right, there are many great memoirs of you. And some of these are right on the verge. Especially uh, O'Malley's book. But also Ed Leahy's book is quasi memoir. Did I answer your question about me? I'm a big fan of Myron Brady. As far as I know, he never came back to view. Anything else? Well, this is a fantastic crowd. I, I hope I have inspired you to uh, read some more beat novels. I'm curious what books you all like or are familiar with. Because I walk around town and I like uh, Wide Open Town because that's what the guy's doing. He's walking around town. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. well, um, how are you familiar with uh, Butte Was Like That? Not really. Um, I highly recommend that. I say in the book, um, James Joyce was famous for saying that if uh, Dublin had been destroyed in World War II, they could have rebuilt the entire city brick by brick from his descriptions in Ulysses. Um, I would say the same is true of Butte, from uh, Butte Was Like That. My favorite was Fire and Brimstone. It was about the Granite Mountain Fire. Or the Granite Mountain Fire. That, yeah, but that's not a novel, is it? That's a, no, it isn't a novel. Yeah. No, there's also many great histories of Butte, too. I tried to focus mainly on the novels because I, I think it hadn't been done yet. Other, <laughs> other books about Butte you like? I do talk about films also, and I learned uh, when I was interviewed by Cherie Newman for Public Radio, I learned that I missed a great one uh, called Psycho Sheep of Butte. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you are, if you are ever bored and have uh, $3 to pay on Netflix, I highly recommend it. <laughs>
Uh, it was made in 2006 by some kids in Bozeman. Um, and if you like Ed Wood or David Lynch, it's a perfect amount of two of those. Oh, no. Psycho, Sh Psycho Sheep of Butte. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to uh, meet you, sign a book. I also brought up copies of my Montana book, if anybody needs a copy of this. Okay.